no one wants to be that guy that, that is to blame or, or gets the bad headlines playing for, playing for their country. I think with, with Raheem, they look at a young black kid and they think that he's, he's a flash kid. Uh, you know, he's obviously earning a lot of money. And I think that some people don't like, like that. I remember my physios saying to me, do I want to see the operation on the, on the DVD after? As I said, my knees, it's a mess. I'm Ledley King, and this is my Behind the Headlines. Well, I grew up a, a single parent, under a single, you know, single parent uh, child. So uh, my mum was a big influence on, on myself and my brother. Uh, you know, I actually had a friend that played, played football with, with me from a very young age who, whose parents helped me a lot you know, in terms of traveling, taking me to football. Uh, you know, they had a big, big impact on, on my life. Uh, enabling me to, to, to kind of do what I love doing. You know, it wasn't it wasn't easy. I had, um, you know, I had, as I say, a good mother, good grandparents that, that helped me, supported me, you know, kept me on the straight and narrow. My childhood was a was a happy one. It wasn't until I got to probably about seven or eight where I joined a team, which was a, a Sunday league team called Senrab. You know, from then on, I started to have visions of hopefully trying to be a, a professional player one day. You know, we had five players that actually went on to become professional players from 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 a, a group of 11 players. So that was Bobby Zamora, uh, J. Lloyd Samuel, Paul Koncheski, myself and John Terry. So needless to say, we had a pretty good, pretty good team. It's just a, a lucky group of players at that age that were, were talented and, and all played together. Well, John was actually a midfield player then, so was, I was all right at the back, yeah. Uh, but we'd, we'd have played together uh, at centre backs. It would have been great, it would have been great competition. And as I say, I, I do think that we did push each other on because we wanted to be the best player in the team. Uh, and that was difficult. But John was a small centre midfield player at the time. Uh, brave, you know, he was different to everyone else in terms of his bravery. You know, he'd put his head uh, where feet were. And, you know, that was rare to see at a young age. Yeah, looking back now, it is, it is scary when you think that, you know, our careers could be so similar in terms of grew up at the, you know, in the same team, wore the same numbers and were centre halves. So, uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite strange. I think my motivation was to do something to make my family proud at a young age. You know, I wanted to, you know, as I say, I saw my mum and how difficult it was for her. You know, I know that she, she leaned on my grandparents a lot. I was very close to my grandparents. Uh, you know, and the funny, funny thing is my nan used to always say to me, you, you haven't made it yet, you haven't made it yet. Uh, even to the point, where, even when I was playing first team, she was saying I still haven't made it yet. What she was doing was keeping my feet on the ground. You know, that, 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 was, that was important and uh, I think that by her saying that always made me think, okay, there must be another level, there must be something else and, and, and that's, that kind of helped me, you know, after the first team, there's still much more to do, obviously you want to play for your country, you want to try and win things, you know, and I think that helped me to, to never get comfortable, to always try and get to the next level. As I got a little bit older, I started to, to realise that I was going to possibly be a defender, so I started to watch defenders and Maldini was, was someone that I loved, the way they played the game, as well as Churam, Lillian Churam, because they played the game um, and they made it look easy. You know, you never saw them looking stressed. Uh, they read the game, they, they, they were just a calming influence and I saw myself being that type of player or hoping to try and be that type of player. It wasn't something I ever entertained. I was captain at that time, so I felt a responsibility to to take the club to the next level and try and win win things and achieve things with the club. So I always said, as long as the club's going in the right direction and improving and, and trying to be a club that, that that competes and win things, then you know I was happy. You know, at that point, it was I was never close to going. Didn't even didn't even think about it. No. You know, for me, in the end, I said that it, it would mean more to win one or two things with the club that I loved than to go elsewhere and win five or six things. You know, I feel it's a shame that by 26 I had my knee problems and, you know, it was probably slightly on the decline from, from that age. You know, we was bringing in the club, uh, bringing in the players that we started to bring into the club at that point, and then we could have really started to, 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 to challenge for things. You know, we had players like Modric, we had Bell coming through, Van der Vaart come to the club. So, you know, towards the back end of my career, uh, we had some, some, some great players. But it's just a shame that you know, I wasn't able to, to be the player that I, that I wanted to be at that age. You know, for me, it was just about playing as many games as I could. Uh, you know, at that point, 
there was n there was never a thought about moving or doing anything. It just became about me being the best player I could to help the team. I knew that I couldn't be the player that, that I should be, but I could still be an important player in the team. Uh, and yeah, when I was out there, I tried to make sure that the team was 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 a better team, and, and that became my 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 target to do. And obviously, you know, qualifying for the Champions League for the first time was great. Uh, and yeah, I suppose the goal, the, the bar, kind of uh, changes a little bit for, for yourself, and you know, through that, it probably changed for the team a little bit as well. So I had to accept that. I think that I had to accept that I wasn't going to be as good as I wanted to be at that point, which which can be quite quite tough to take. You know, I wanted to be the best in, in my position. And then once I accepted that, it became about you know what what I can do now to to prolong my career, to to be able to have an impact still. You know, not just be going through the motions, but to still have an impact on my team. You know, it's strange because even with not training, I was still being picked to, to meet up with England. And I never felt confident in, in my body to, to go and play an extra game with England because through not training, my muscles would, would uh, I'd have muscle injuries all the time. So I'd play three or four games for, for, for Tottenham. Then I'd f feel my hamstring go or my groin go. Uh, I'd come back, play three or four games. England would say, can you join? I'd say no, because I didn't trust my body. I went on a good run of games before the World Cup in 2010, where for the first time I actually felt confident I could get through uh, the extra games or, or be able to go to the World Cup. Because people say to me, I really went because it's the World Cup, but it wasn't. I wouldn't put myself in that position if I didn't believe that I could, could, could do it. Uh, so yeah, I went to the World Cup and, <laughs> and I broke down, uh, which was which is again tough to take. But I remember doing the, the an interview uh, while I was away with England, and I think it was it was taken a little bit out of context in terms of you know I can't have a kick around. I, I mean I can still kick a ball, but I just can't move the same way, and you, I probably have a little bit of discomfort doing so. But yeah, I think it was taken out of context a little bit in terms of you know, playing with playing with myself. Because no one wants to be that guy that, that is to blame or, or gets the bad headlines playing for playing for their country. So there was no doubt we had some great players and you know a great great team during my time and, and a team that should have done better. But I think probably that probably had an impact. You know, you look at the team now and and they look happy, they look fearless. Uh, they probably have a good, a good relationship with the, with the press uh, at the moment, which, which is you can see in, in their football. Uh, I think that Gareth Southgate's done a tremendous job in terms of kind of taking the shackles off them and, and letting them, f or helping them to feel like a club club team. Well, I think everyone always felt that that pressure, and it's something now that I, I hope that the players are not not feeling as much. How do you feel he's been treated at the moment? From Ledley King's point of view, well, I think that I think that when you look at look at him, um, you know, I think that through social media, through people, you know, having more of a more eyes on on, on players these days, you know, people start to, to to make judgments. They 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 start to think that they know people, and I, and I think with, with Raheem, they look at. A young black kid, and they think that he's he's a flash kid. Uh, you know, he's obviously earning a lot of money, and I think that some people don't like like that. I think that when he left Liverpool, that obviously was probably the start of how people started to feel towards him, thinking that he only cares about the money. But I think that if you look at Raheem and, and what he's done at Man City since he's been there, you know, he's just a, he's a player that's improved each season. He's someone that probably runs more than anyone on the pitch in, his, in the team. You know, he's a quiet, shy kid. Yeah, and you know, I think that he has been made a scapegoat over the last year or two, and I think that it's probably because of the, these reasons that I've, that I've mentioned. And of course, it does have a, an undertone of, of racism because you know it probably goes back to to some degree. Uh, Things 
with rap, the rap generation and people looking at people in, involved in music and rap and and you know you think that they want gangster wannabes or they're flashy or this and that and I think people look at that and they probably translate that to some of our young black players you know people probably like Pogba and uh, and, and think that these these people are young and flashy and, and, and reckless and you know it couldn't be further from the truth so you know I was I was a lucky one that never really suffered in terms of abuse on the, on the, on the pitch uh, but there's plenty of people that would come before me that that, that did suffer and uh, you know although, although we've come a long way there's still still work to be done and uh, you know hopefully now we can we, we can hopefully move forward and, and continue to, to, to improve the situation when you said you weren't confident in your body, you must have been living with a constant fear. Did that mentality mm. ever affect your performances on the pitch? Did you make different decisions because you were like, if I go for this tackle, I yeah, something not not in, not in terms of tackle. Put it this way, I wasn't scared of ever being in a 50-50 tackle, but I couldn't just recklessly let my body go because if I kind of went down in a weird position, you know, it put a lot of stress on my knee and it would, it would hurt my knee because I couldn't actually bend my knee back fully so you know you can imagine sliding on the floor and if your leg does go fully back then it jolts and it's a lot of pain so I had to control my movements a lot more I probably became a bit more intelligent with my picking and choosing when to to run when to be a bit more clever because when I was younger I, although I still feel I had a good understanding of the game I was I was still quite quick so I was able to to get out of trouble with pace. Um, so when I was injured, it became less about running and, and, and trusting my speed, but more about being an intelligent defender. Did you feel isolated? Yeah. How, how was that? To, how did you cope with training away from the team? Yeah, that's tough. That's the tough part because you, you know you come in every day to, to, to training. Well, saying that, I didn't even. I would come in at a different time to the ones that were training. So you know, there's certain times where. I'd, I hardly saw my teammates because uh, I might come in slightly later so they could have their treatments and, and get ready for training and be out on the pitch by the time some of the injured players came so we was in each other's way. So that's quite tough. You miss out on obviously the, the banter on the, on the training pitch. You miss out on all the stories, uh, all the, you know, as I say, all the laughs and, and, and that's quite tough. As I say, you know, you just got to try and keep strong, keep positive keep bouncing back even though it's tough uh, because you love doing it you know you love playing the game and, and you want to do it as long as you can well to be honest I didn't really listen to my doc the doctor that's that's it simple I, I judged it on how it felt so I remember my physios saying to me do I want to see the operation on the, on the DVD after as I said my knees it's a mess and I didn't want to see it because I didn't want things to creep into my head how bad my knee was. So I always, I always based it on how it felt and not what people told me. So um, it, was, it was as simple as that, really. I, you know, if the doctor told me four years earlier to, that I'd have to quit, I would have said no, I don't because I know how it feels. I'm the one who's got the knee. I, I actually know so. That's the way I. That's the way I treated it. I, 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 treat, I treated it on how it felt and what I knew I could do with it um, until it got to the point where I couldn't do it at a level that I wanted to do it anymore. And you know, if I'd have kept playing, then I would have damaged myself or, or been uh, with a walking stick from you know in, in my early or oh, late thirties or early forties, which was something that, that I didn't really want to do. So yeah, it was time. Well, yeah, it was a strange one. I mean, I wasn't playing in the in the game, um, so I, I arranged to meet up with Jermaine Genus, who, who was also injured. Uh, so we, we met up at the training ground to travel down to, to West Ham to, to, to watch the game. And he said to me, "Have you heard everyone's ill?" So I said, "No, no way." But it wasn't until we got to the stadium, <clears throat> went into the changing room, and you know, there was no life in there. People were sitting there with their, their head in their laps. Uh, 
and that's when I realised, you know, this <laughs> this is going to be tough because it should have been a, a great occasion for us to try and go there and, and, and get a result to, to finish in the top four for the first time. But, you know, that, that change room had, had nothing nothing in it. And even the ones that, that had to play, uh, there were some that couldn't play, there were some that had to play with uh, food poisoning. And you can imagine what it's like you know, when, you feel, when you're not feeling well and you've got food poisoning. The last thing you want to do is be running around. So, you know, I had a lot of respect for the players that went out there and had a go. But I think we, yeah, we had nine, nine or ten players that were, that, that were really struggling that day. And uh, yeah, it was just it was typical. It was typical that, uh, you know, I was hoping that the game was going to get called off. You know, it, it, we end up losing in, in the end. But, I was, you know, I was proud as, as a captain of a group of players. I was proud that players went out there and, and gave it a go, even though they was really struggling. But did it just feel at the time like you were destined to finish below Arsenal? Yeah, because... Every single year. How did you deal yeah. with that disappointment? Yeah, it was getting to a point where, you know, we was closing the gap on Arsenal because for, for most of my career, Arsenal were, were, were levels above above Tottenham. You know, they were a team that were competing for, for the league. Uh, and we were a team that, you know, when I first started, we were mid-table, mid top 10, and slowly but surely we started you know, creeping up. They probably started to creep down slightly to a point where we, we started to get real close to them. And you know, that was the first time that we had the opportunity to, to finish above them. And, and uh, yeah, at that point, it just felt like you know, it was just our luck. You know, even further down the line, when, when we, we qualified for the Champions League, finishing fourth and Chelsea won the Champions League, uh, and we wasn't able to, to compete in it the next year. That was again something that you just felt could only happen to, to, to us at the time. Yeah, I'm just happy now that we're in a, a place now under Pochettino that uh, you know all that seems to be forgotten about, and and you know we have a manager that that we've been crying out for for, for a long, long time. You know, d during my career, there was too much chopping and changing in terms of manager managers to really be able to to. Uh, to kind of st stake a claim uh, of finishing, you know, consistently in the in the top four or, or winning things because, you know, I think I played under maybe six six managers in 12, 13 years, and it's very difficult to to, to achieve things when you know you have that uh, overall of managers. So I'm just glad now we have a manager that, and, and everyone's on on the same page in terms of the club, the manager, from the top to bottom, and uh, you know we can see the results now. Yeah, is that the do you think the biggest testament to him that he's been able to reverse this mindset and your power team that is expected to finish in the top four? Yeah, yeah, I think that was a big thing, the mentality of the club. And obviously he's, he's a South American, so he's passionate. You know, he's driven, he's driven. Although he's a qu quiet, quiet guy, uh, obviously a really, really nice guy, he's still got that tough, tough streak about him. And, and I think that that has trans translated to the players. Uh, I remember when we lost to Chelsea, or well, we drew with Chelsea actually, when, the year when Leicester won the league and it was for the first time I'd seen the, the team really stand up for themselves. You know, we was almost bullying some of the Chelsea players at the time and, you know, the players let a bit of frustration get to them in terms of, you know, probably let the league slip at that point. But for me, looking at it, I was pleased because for the first time in a long time I'd seen a group of players that, that really were together and cared about trying to win and trying to achieve things. So I knew that at that point that the club were, were in good hands. Which managers affected you the most throughout your career who gave you that, you know, that bit of advice or that um, wing, etc.? I think different managers had different impacts. I think that well, George Graham was someone who gave me my debut and he was a disciplinarian. Um, quite old school. So I think for a young kid, a young defender, he was helpful because, you know, I think he helped me with the fundamentals. Then Glenn Hoddle took over, totally different, different. Uh, but I loved playing under Glenn because he was, he was the side of the game that I loved. George Graham was probably the side of the game that I needed. Playing under Martin Yol, I enjoyed Martin Yol because that's when I was really captain in the side, you know, trying to be leader of the, of the squad. Uh, and then, of course, as I say, with, with uh, Harry, 
probably the best team that I played in. So I really enjoyed that football. And of course, you know, you can never tell uh, or you never know if a manager, a different manager would have allowed me to, 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 to play without training. You know, uh, I'm not sure Pochettino would allow me to, to, to play without training. So, you know, I'm thankful for, for Harry really for allowing me to do that. Maybe the most bizarre question I've asked, but what do you think to his exploits in the jungle when you see an ex-manager? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's when, that's when you know the game's changed, I think, when, it's, when that happens. But, uh, listen, I knew, I knew he'd do well. I knew how he'd do well. He's a, he's a people's person. Uh, so yeah, I'm really happy for him. But yeah, strange, strange world we, we're living in now. Eh? What you do realise is that you kind of have that freedom to to just get away, which you don't have during during the season. So I think that was something that was strange but nice. Christmas, was something that was totally different. Uh, not having to report for around Christmas time and being at home. I always thought I'd love being at home and then I got bored really quickly on Christmas. Get bored really quickly, so yeah, I think players were just moaning about everything. You know, when, when you're playing, you're moaning that you, you can't enjoy Christmas and then when, when you can enjoy Christmas, you want to be playing. So uh, yeah, that's, that's another thing that's quite different because for, for many years, I've never been able to relax and, and, and enjoy Christmas. Uh, I think everyone always says that the career, your career goes so fast and when you're young you don't really, you don't really listen. When you're playing, you know, it's, diff it's difficult to enjoy football because you're always reacting to a result, whether it's a defeat or a, or a win, but you, you, you're already thinking about the next game. Uh, so you don't really get a chance to enjoy it. You, you, you're always analysing your, your own game, can I do better? You know, without knowing it, it's, it's, it's the best time. You know, you're, having, you're living your best life, so to speak. So try to appreciate it and, you know, give everything to the game while, you, while you're there.